For Kumuhulu Mele Kahale Puna Chan, traditional Hawaiian featherwork was her birthright. Her tutu, Mary Lou Kekueva, literally wrote the book on it. Nalima Mili Hulu No Eau was started in 1991 by Mele's mother and grandparents. Today, Kumu Mele runs the workshop and keeps the family tradition alive by teaching the next generation of feather lay makers. Yes, my husband is a captain with the Hawaiian Tug and Barge, so he has some time on his hands. So he ties these little bundles of feathers together that he's using to make a cape. And my daughter Paulette, that's at the Bishop Museum, has classes. And then her daughter made her first lay when she was five years old. We all live in the same house and with feathers all oh. over. <laughs> it was a lei pua hulu. So it was flowers. I tied around the stamen to form little flowers. For a child of five years old to sit and make little feather flowers is quite an achievement. <laughs> I made a bunch of these little flowers and they were pretty good. And then my tutu took those flowers and she assembled them together to make a lei. And um, she wore it proudly. Aloha, my name is Mele Kahale Punachan and I am the owner, teacher, manager of Nalima Mili Hulu no Eau. What we do here is we teach Hawaiian featherwork. So Nalima Mili Hulu no Eau is a business that was established back in 1991 by my tutu, Auntie Mary Lou Kekueva, my grandpa, Uncle Paul Kekueva, and my mom, Paulette Kahalepuna. And the name Nalima Mili Hulu no Eau was given to my tutu by Auntie Edith Kanakaole, and it means the skilled hands touch the feathers. My tutu, as everyone know as Auntie Mary Lou, back in 1955, she met her kumuhulu, her feather teacher, Auntie Leilani Fernandez. Auntie Leilani was the head of Alahui wardrobe at the time. And back then, besides just the clothing, the wardrobe department also made all the feather lei that were worn by members of the royal court, as well as the kahili. And little did she know that the featherwork would become her life's passion. In the 70s, with the Hawaiian Renaissance and the growth of Hawaiian civic clubs and other people who were a part of this growing entity with other um, Hawaiian art styles, or as it was called, Hawaiiana back then, um, she started teaching all over the place. I remember as a child, every weekend packing up our station wagon, which always had a banana on the antenna so we could find it everywhere we went, and going to every community park on the island, going to craft fairs, going to locations to teach or to sell or whatever it may be, that was part of my life. Tutu was able to teach at Bishop Museum on a regular basis every Thursday, and that was where I believe feather work that we knew today really started to grow. Featherwork in Hawaii was brought um, by our first Polynesian settlers. Uh, it was, it's a practice that's found all across the Pacific, uh, and in Hawaii, we use birds from both the upland forest as well as the sea. The upland forest birds provided the, the brilliant colored feathers, the reds, the yellows, the greens, blacks. Uh, and then the seabirds provided the more neutral colors, the, the grays, the whites, um, and the beiges. So it's just in combination with one another that provided um, the basis for all different kinds of feather work, um, being made into feather capes, feather helmets, feather lei. In Hawaiian culture, feathers are very special and sacred um, and reserved primarily for the chiefly class. Um, if feathers were used in other forms, they were used in very specific occasions. Um, for instance, in hula, there are, there's a feather rattle called an uli uli that mixes the uses of different kinds of um, bird feathers. And in many instances, those are used um, in very specific songs and chants, um, oftentimes associated with chiefly heritages and stories. But in general, the, the use of feather, feather work was a means to connect to the divine that supernatural world from which 
um, the chiefs received their, their mana or their, their chiefly authority. So the o'o is one of the birds that provided a lot of the, the feathers for a Hawaiian feather work and they provided both the black and yellow feathers. Um, the o'o were found on all of the main Hawaiian islands. Each island had their own species of o'o uh, and the, the o'o from the big island provided the largest and most fluffiest yellow feathers um, to be used in, in Hawaiian feather work in comparison to the o'o from Kauai, which only had small feathers on their feet, right above their feet, and primarily all black. Yeah, so these are birds that had very small uh, amount of feathers that were available for use in Hawaiian feather work. I look back in history and how the work was done then in comparison to how we do it now, and thank you, Jesus, I was born in this modern time. <laughs> because the work involved. I mean, students come in here and when they're first learning all the steps that it takes to make this finished product, they're like, oh, oh my God, how long does it take to do that? And I remind them what our kupuna did. You know, first of all, you didn't have a store or a company you could call and order feathers and have them just delivered to you. You know, you had bird catchers. There was a particular practitioner um, in Hawaiian culture called the Kia Manu. The Kia Manu were skilled bird catchers that would go up into the forest and gather feathers uh, from various birds. Uh, and they would know where to go depending on the type of bird that they were looking for. They would use different techniques to catch them. So set up large snare nets um, in the canopies, sometimes uh, putting sap on different branches where they knew the birds frequented so that the birds would get stuck on these um, sappy branches. Sometimes doing a similar thing but on these long poles that have a perch on it called a kia and then they would have a, a decoy bird um, that would be attached to that the top of the kia to attract other birds to land on the perch um, so that they could catch, um, catch them. Um, so there are various techniques on gathering feathers from these different birds. The process was a, a non-lethal practice where they would, would only take the, the amount of feathers that they could um, and release the bird. If you can imagine just plucking six to ten feathers from a bird. Now mind you, these birds were tiny. What it took to have enough of that to make a lay. You know, today we have goose feathers, we have chicken feathers, we have pheasant. What takes us today maybe 40 hours to complete, back in the days of old Hawaii, could have taken years to complete. So much simpler times now. Being born into this family, we were a feather family. Our lives revolved around feathers. I mean, you could be in the middle of dinner and there's feathers. <laughs> you know, um, open up the washing machine and there's feathers. Feathers everywhere. And so we spent a lot of time working together. Even in times where it was just my tutu, my mom and I, you know, my tutu was working on whatever she would be working on and my mom's working on whatever. And then I usually had specific tasks, you know, sew those ribbons onto those, onto that yarn, cut these feathers or weigh these feathers. Um, you know, I'm grateful for those times because that's where I learned a lot of what I know that I'm now able to carry on and teach to my students and anyone who's interested in coming to learn. So after the death of King Kamehameha and the first missionaries coming to Hawaii and introduction of more Western contact, uh, Hawaiian feather work started to wane uh, because there was no use for it in the same way that it was useful in, in the past. Um, so a lot of the feather practitioners that carried on that tradition um, weren't able to pass that knowledge on to the next generation. Teaching this art form is my biggest joy. We teach to school students, hula halau. We've taught to women's organizations. We've taught to clubs. Um, anyone, basically, that's interested. We start from prepping feathers and we follow through to the completed um, project. Hawaiian feather work, to me, is a practice that is 
thriving and well today. Uh, we have many practitioners all across the islands um, and, and across the continent, around, across the world that are perpetuating and carrying on this practice. My tutu is famous for saying, not as long as I can help it. And, and, and that's, that's it. That's the thing is a lot of people make comments that, oh, you know, this art is dying. Not as long as we can help it. Not as long as I can help it. Um, the many students that have come through here who have fallen in love with this art form, it'll never die.